scenes to be pictures, so they build that into the picture. So you had to lay out uh, what it looked like, and then you had to produce the page. You'd wrap it in what they call the chase, so it didn't move, and it was the chase that went to the printing press to be printed. You had you, your cases with all the type in, and you actually you had to learn the layout of the type cases because it wasn't like A, B, C, D. It was it was done in an order, which is supposed to be a bit like when you a QWERTY keyboard. keyboard. It's not A, B, C, D. It's diff and it's someone's worked out that the easiest way to do it. So you, as an apprentice, you had to learn the layout of the case. That was the first thing you did. So you, then you'd automatically went to the individual letters without looking. It sounds very antiquated now, and it, and it is, but at the time, that's what printers did. But at lunchtime, that's where everyone had the lunch. So there'd be poker schools going on. So sort of five minutes before the end of lunch, you might have 100 people standing round, you know, waiting for the poker game to finish. I come here as a 17-year-old, 17 17-and-a-half-year-old. 17 it was good, it was really good at that age to be involved in. At the same time as working in Amazon, I started my own company called Rainhill Tape Specialist and then shortened to RTS. We moved to Prescott and the only place we could find big enough for us was the old Tindlings building. That used to be an army barracks. And when we were moving in and we had builders in, we were knocking through to put access into the backyard for the stacker truck. And what we didn't realise was the wall the builders were knocking through was actually a massive cavity. So they found a love letter and a piece of jewellery in there once we got some lights in. And it, the love letter was from a young lady to her boyfriend who was a Lance Corporal. We had a couple of studios. These were post-production studios and we started duplicating cassettes um, for local bands, local people, churches, choirs, local radio, everything Billy Butler did with hits you couldn't get and the old famous Hold Your Plums on a Sunday morning. Uh, all that went onto tape and Billy and Wally would come up to our place and they'd go through all the editing and then we'd churn them out. I mean, one year we did a million cassettes for local gigging artists just to sell at clubs on Saturday night, or Friday night, whatever. And Rick Astley was one of those with his band FBI. The company was started originally in 1966. It got started by my uncle Stephen, who was a hobby craft leather worker beforehand. He used to do like craft fairs, trade shows, things like that. So he was at a craft fair in London. So he was on the side of a street with a display and a mini workshop. And he was making things and he had a display of his products. A chap walked along. Um, that was looking at the stand and picked up, was looking at a bag that he'd made for, um, it's like a school satchel, classic school satchel. And he's like, he's looking at this thing and looking at Steve and Steve spoke to him and said, you all right, mister? Steve actually thought he was in trouble. He thought like, he didn't realize that the classic satchel design had been around since Shakespearean times. And it's just part of the British public domain of copyright designs, you know? He's looking at this thing and he said, did you make this? And he's like, uh, yes, sir. You know, and he's like, he's, he's like, he says, is anything wrong? So he says, I can't just have me here looking at this bag and I've got to kind of find out what's going on. So he says, is, is there anything wrong? He says, no. He says, well, okay, would, would, would you like to buy it? And he says, no, young man, I'd be interested in buying 200 of them. And that led to a conversation which started the Leather Satchel Company. But back when my uncle started the business, companies were named after the products they made. The 
brass widget company, the sliced bread company, the leather satchel company. It's like, yeah, because they can find us in the yellow pages when they need us or whatever, you know. I grew up being around leather work with my uncles, obviously in the business, running the business. Um, I lived in the same house as them, so it was part of our everyday life, working with leather. And I basically used to go, like on a Saturday, I'd go in with them, or during school holidays, I'd go in, can I go to the workshop? You know, and it'd be like, it'd be great for me. You know, I loved it. And so that's how I got involved in the business. At 16, I started my apprenticeship. We made all kinds. So my uncle Steve is actually trained as a clog maker as well. So we used to make clogs. I can remember I was the lad and I've got all these boxes and I'm going, by heck, there's a lot of these. He says, oh, heavy. I'm going, are these all clogs, Uncle Barry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are they for? Queen. I was like, the Queen wears clogs. He says, no, the banyan, <laughs> you idiot. You know what I mean? We used to have a guy we nicknamed Brummy, his name was Keith, but he used to go on the road and, and basically flog all our stuff out the back of a van to local retailers and shops. So he'd look at stuff, what we had, he'd go, oh, I've got loads of guitar straps. I'd go to visit all the, the music shops and he'd travel around. Do you want any music straps? What do you need, a saxophone or a guitar? Yeah, it's a guitar, yeah. And he'd just do cash and carry out the back of a van to all these shops. Do you need any bags? I've got some, yeah, what a day, lovely, aren't they? All our straps are in all these, these, these music, independent music shops all around the country. We'd watch Top of the Pops and then we, we'd go, has he got one of, Barry? Is that one of our straps? <laughs> so it, you, you, we then started playing a game every Friday night. We'd be watching Top of the Pops to see who's got our strap on, which is really cool. Go, oh my God, the Oasis lads have got one of our straps on. You'd be really excited. So we used to play like the strap football <laughs> and see who can spot the straps. The list, honestly, it's endless. Absolutely endless. You'd think we were the only strap maker in the world, but it's just funny, you know. The market for satchels gradually declined to the point where we were the last remaining satchel maker in the UK until there was just my uncles, um, Uncle Steve, Uncle Barry, Uncle Paul. Harry Potter came along. Everyone suddenly saw like this old vintage style and the kids were like, I want a Harry, I want to be like Harry Potter, I want a Harry Potter bag. And the company started growing and growing and growing. And you know, and what was, 30, 40 satchels a month was soon. Oh, okay, we're gonna make 2,000 this month. This is a business again. And we thought it'd die down again, you know, and it just didn't, it's kept growing ever since. We get this call one day from the mayor of Liverpool. He says, I've got some guests coming. We'd like to present them with a gift. I'm going like, who is it? He says, I can't really say. And I'm like, well, I just need some bags off you. I says, to, to be honest, I need to know who it's for so I can make the right bag that's suitable for them. And then he says, okay, but don't tell anyone. And he says, I've got Prince William coming to the city and we want to present him with some of your bags as a gift. So I'm like, oh my God. I mean, such an honor. So we ended up making free backpacks for George, Charlotte and Louis, little kids' backpacks. And they were presented and Prince William picks them up. The beautiful thing, the very first thing he said, wow, these are really good quality, aren't they? <laughs> the first thing he did, this is a guy who must handle the best quality items in the world and picks up one of our utility satchels and says that. So it's like, it's absolutely fantastic. So then, looks directly at me and my wife and says, did you make these? And we're like, uh, yeah. And then just comes and talks to us for like five minutes, asking everything about the company. And it just goes a bit nuts after that. So the press pick up on it, it hits national and international newspapers to the point whereby on the front page of cosmopolitan.com, there's <clears throat> Princess Charlotte, the Queen of Sass, free in brackets now has a better bag than you, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it just went nuts. The website was crashing left, right and center. We were like, get it back up, get it back up. 
just incredible the amount of support we got from like all over the world, people visiting, buying, everyone wanted to buy a bag just like Princess Charlotte. And I think there's a real renaissance of handcrafted goods, knowing, having a relationship with your local makers and seeing that quality and buying locally. And, and the beauty of what we do is really appreciated by the local people, like the people of Merseys. I think that's one of the reasons why we were the last satchel maker as well. It's just incredible support here, you know, it's like, and we love it, absolutely love it, you know. We are fundamentally sustained by the local market. We have export, which allows us to grow and develop and take part in other things, but this business survives because of Merseyside, you know, and that, that's our connection to the local people.